All right. You guys ready to continue on? We'll finish up uh, neurology and then move on into our rheumatology section. Any questions from stuff from last week? You guys have perfect recall from everything from last week, right? Good. Okay. We'll, we'll do a little bit of recall. We'll do a total recall, if you will. Um, no. Okay. So for the, the nerds got that in the room. Um, all right. So for migraines, what are some options we have for kind of acute treatment of, of migraines? So we talked about sumatriptan. So we talked about the triptans. And what do those do? They vasoconstrict, correct, by acting on what receptors? It's on the slide. 5-HT, 1-D, 1-B, right? So we're agonizing those receptors. It's going to cause vasoconstriction, right? Because we think the, the issue with migraines is we're having too much kind of cerebral blood flow. We're having that vasodilation, causing pressure on those nerves, and that's what's leading to the pain, right? So we want to uh, counteract that by causing some vasoconstriction. Uh, what's another good option as an abortive treatment? Comes from a fungus. It's an ergot. Yeah, that's true. Dihydroergotamine, or DHE, is usually the, the big one you see, right? So you have like nasal sprays, you have IV forms. Um, that is basically doing the same thing as the triptans. Uh, you know, agonizing those 1D, 1B receptors cause vasoconstriction. Um, do you guys remember any patients you don't want to use those uh, ergots in? Pregnancy, absolutely, yes. It's an abortive patient, uh, category X. You do not want to use ergots in those patients. Usually messing with blood flow to the fetus is not usually a good thing, so we'll kind of leave those alone. Um, all right, so how do we choose the triptans? We kind of talked about uh, there's several that are available, kind of sumatriptan being your kind of first generation, the first one that was kind of out in the market, and then you had several um, kind of Me Too drugs that were starting to come out that try to kind of shore up some of the weaknesses uh, that sumatriptan has, because uh, we saw there's a lot of recurrence of, of migraines, especially even during the, the same day uh, for some of these patients. So. Um, you know, sumatriptan is certainly still a good drug, certainly still one you can start with. So, you know, usually even 15 minutes after a subcutaneous injection, um, you know, 75% of patients should have some response to that, which is good. Um, obviously, having um, intranasal or PO forms are going to take a little bit longer just because it takes longer for them to kind of get to the, the site of action, right? It's to go through the GI tract or has to go through uh, absorption through, uh, through the nose and, and kind of go through the venous system. Usually IV will even be a little bit faster than, than the sub-Q. Um, but again, the, the recurrence rates are kind of the issue that we run into uh, just due to a relatively short half-life. So uh, second generation guys are meant to uh, decrease the recurrence. And what do you think is one way we could fix that? How can we decrease recurrence? Increase the duration of action of the drug, right? So we said that sumatriptan has a relatively short half-life. We're going to have drugs that maybe have better half-lives or have, say, better bioavailability, which means, you know, a higher fraction of that drug is going to be absorbed better. Um, and then hopefully we can decrease some of those adverse effects. So we mentioned with sumatriptan, you see, you know, like chest tightness and dyspnea and all those kind of really uncomfortable feelings uh, for those patients. You know, they already have a headache. You probably don't want to cause them any other kind of grief, right? Um, so the, the second generation agents you're going to see either have, you know, greater uh, receptor potency, meaning they uh, can get to the site of action, uh, you know, smaller amount of drug, uh, but there'll still be uh, higher potency at the receptors. Um, some of them will have increased lipophilicity, which makes it easier to cross the blood-brain barrier. Um, and then I mentioned the, the increased half-life and, and bioavailability. So um, we'll kind of go through just the, the individual ones and just kind of highlight some of the differences that they have amongst one another. Um, you have zolmatriptan. Uh, this one you can have as an uh, ODT. Do you guys know what that stands for? Yeah, oral disintegrating tablet, oral dissolving tablet. So that's good for what type of patients? Nausea. Yeah, ones that are vomiting, right? So that's why you see like Zofran or Ondansetron comes as an ODT frequently, uh, because if your patient's actively vomiting, you know, the idea of swallowing something may not be too appealing to them. Um, but nasal sprays are also available, so lots, lots of good options for them. Um, that one, you, you'll see pretty similar efficacy to, to Sumatriptan. <laughs> You have uh, an aerotriptan or emerge. This has a uh, higher bioavailability than you see for sumatriptan and a longer half-life, so around six hours or so. Uh, so that duration of action is gonna be a little bit longer. You do need to worry about things like accumulation if you have hepatic or renal disease for some of those patients. Um, and the other kind of the problem with, with this one is that even though it has lower recurrence rate, you're gonna see that it has kind of a slower onset of action. So maybe more problematic for patients. Yeah, this may be good for a patient who, say, has aura beforehand, and they can know that, hey, I'm about to get a migraine. Let's go ahead and take this drug beforehand, so that way we can maybe prevent the migraine from occurring. Uh, so that may be one good option for those patients. 
Uh, you have risotriptan, which also comes as an ODT formulation. Um, this one is unique because it actually has a uh, interaction with propranolol. Uh, so you actually end up seeing a higher AUC or area of the curve, or basically, you know, kind of total body exposure to the drug uh, will go up when it's mixed with propranolol. And that'll be important because when we talk about preventative therapies, you'll see beta blockers are going to be one of those, one of those um, options. And so uh, for this one, if they're on propranolol for, say, preventative uh, treatment of migraines, this one you'd actually want to decrease the dose, because otherwise you might see too much uh, effect, get too much vasoconstrict in it, and uh, see more symptoms develop. Uh, but this one does have the fastest onset, so it is uh, one of its claims to fame. So you can see here, you know, just start like you usually half the normal starter dose if you had propranolol on board. Uh, next, you have almotriptan, which has probably the highest uh, bioavailability, but this one is also metabolized by 3A4 and monoamine oxidase. You guys remember that enzyme from what section? Antidepressants, right? So monoamine oxidase is normally responsible for metabolizing a lot of catecholamines and things like that. So uh, anything inhibiting 3A4 or monoamine oxidase is going to lead to higher levels of this drug. Uh, L-triptan, very similar, uh, but it's metabolized by 3A4, is pretty good bioavailability. Uh, and then for Ovotriptan, uh, this one is unique just in the fact that it has the longest half-life out of the group. So about 25 hours or so. Um, so you're probably going to see uh, the least amount of recurrence with this drug out of, out of the bunch. So for these uh, patients, you want to use uh, migraine-specific agents uh, for those who have severe migraine who kind of resport, uh, respond to poorly to NSAIDs. So you, you again, kind of want to go by a stepwise approach using things with um, kind of the least amount of systemic side effects. So NSAIDs you know, are a good way to start, uh, and they are not responding to that. Then you can use some of these more uh, migraine-specific treatments, your DHE or you use your, your triptans. Um, Again, uh, non-oral routes are going to be best for patients who are having a you know, pretty significant nausea and vomiting associated with this. Uh, and then for the, the subcutaneous routes, give about an hour for it to work. Let your patients know, hey, it's not going to be immediate. It's not going to be like getting an IV dose of, say, morphine or something. But uh, it's going to take a little bit of time and even longer for the intranasal or PO routes. So that's why it's a good education point to say, as soon as you think you're going to have a migraine, go ahead and take a dose. And that way, uh, you can hopefully prevent it from occurring. Uh, we do not want to use uh, triptans and ergots and or, right, so uh, within 24 hours uh, of use. So you worry about, especially uh, with the longer acting ones, uh, specifically having kind of excessive prolonged vasospasm, right? Um, so this is, uh, I was mentioning that one patient that we had uh, the other day, um, you know, say 15 year old girl comes in, you know, she's you know in the dark room with her sunglasses on at nine o'clock at night um, due, to, due to migraine. She actually had come in Friday uh, and then also had come in Sunday. Okay, um, so the DHE that we given her on Friday had hopefully uh, prevented a recurrence you know, during those next two days. But had she come in on Saturday, probably would have recommended against giving her another dose of DHE because then you worry about too much vasospasm there. But because it was Friday to Sunday, it, you know, at that point the the drug's pretty much worn off. It's okay to give another dose. So that'd be one uh, contraindication there. Um, and then you typically would like to avoid using more than two days per week of, of abortive therapy. Um, you run into issues of, of medication overuse headache, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, but for the most part, no more than two times a week uh, and even less if we can, right? Which is where our preventative therapy is gonna really come into play there. So speaking of medication overuse headaches, um, this is going to be usually seen with patients who um, are overusing things like ergotamines, triptan. Some patients uh, will you know, require opioid therapy if they've you know, kind of failed everything else. Um, if they're having more than, say, like 15 headaches per month, um, you know, or if they're using things like ergots, triptans, or opioids, you know, say the more than 10 days per month, right? So very, very frequent use of, of these drugs. Um, and you kind of see this kind of hypersensitivity to the pain where uh, even though they're, they're keep treating more and more frequently, um, the, the pain's not really getting much better for them or the, the headache recurrence is not getting any better. So uh, what you end up seeing is that uh, this can resolve for these patients, so especially after discontinuation of many of the drugs. Um, and it kind of has to be kind of a weaning process, but within two months or so, um, they should be able to get back to kind of a, a baseline for them. So, um, you know, and you can kind of look at it based on how much medication they're using for their headache. So if I say something between like 7 to 12 analgesic tabs or capsules per day, um, you can, you know, discontinue the analgesic um, either abruptly, which may lead to some recurrence of, of uh, pain, or, or you can taper it over a four to six week kind of period. Um, and during this time period, you also want to initiate some prophylactic medications, which we'll talk about in just a second. Um, 
you know, some of the withdrawal symptoms for them coming off those medications, especially abruptly, can uh, last few days to weeks, and so that taper can kind of help with that, right? So just kind of steadily lowering their dose over time frame or, or using, seeing how often they're actually using the, the doses. And then um, if they're using, say, more than 12, you know, doses of medication uh, or, or tabs or capsules, you know, per day, or if they're pregnant, you definitely want to uh, do not dis abruptly discontinue, just kind of slowly taper them off during that four to six week period. So for preventative therapy, who might be a candidate? So obviously those that uh, have kind of recurrent or more frequent migraine uh, that interferes with any of their like, daily routines, you know, despite acute treatment, um, you know, those are definitely going to be good candidates for that. I don't know if you guys, if anyone uh, of you or, or a loved one suffers from migraines, but I, I know I had, when I was an undergrad, uh, we had one uh, RA at the dorms who uh, she had, you know, severe migraines. And I mean, she'd be out of commission for like two or three days, right? Um, just where she could not leave the, leave the room just due to the, the phonophobia and the photophobia and all of that. Um, so it can be very debilitating. And so she would have been a perfect candidate for some of these uh, more preventative uh, therapies. Um, you know, if they have any kind of contraindications or failures of a lot of the other kind of abortive drugs, this might be also good uh, candidates for preventative therapy, um, you know, and then looking at, you know, especially cost of acute or preventative therapies, a lot of these drugs you're going to see are, are fairly cheap for the most part. Um, so this could be, you know, kind of a cost effective approach for them. So uh, the first group we'll look at are going to be our beta blockers. So this is usually first line therapy. It can be effective up to 80% of your patients. Um, kind of the gold standard is going to be propranolol. Um, that's probably been used most frequently. Has probably the most uh, evidence behind it. If you guys remember, uh, do you guys remember anything unique about the kinetics of propranolol? Blood brain barrier. Mm -hmm. Right, that's the problem with using it in elderly patients, right? You see problems with patients with dementia, they have you know, hallucinations and nightmares and things like that because it's very lipophilic, crosses the blood-brain barrier. So that makes sense why we would go with propranolol because it's getting directly to those you know, kind of cerebral vessels and can work very effectively there. So that's kind of the, the idea why we go with propranolol. Certainly others could still work. Uh, so you know, who might be contraindicated from receiving propranolol? Yeah, so asthmatics or something, because you know propranolol is non-selective, right? So it's going to be affecting beta-1 and beta-2 receptors. Um, so by uh, adding on, uh, you know, a, a beta-1 selective drug, you still get some activity of the beta-2 receptor. So it's thought to still be somewhat effective, maybe just not as much as propranolol. And so uh, if you might imagine, um, you know, what would a beta blocker do to blood vessels? What do you think it might do? Is it constrict or dilate? Should vasodilate, right? Um, does that sound like it should work for migraines? No. So that's why these drugs are kind of counterintuitive. Um, the idea is if you kind of kind of reset your, your point of vasodilation, right? So by having kind of this low-grade vasodilatory kind of action, um, you kind of prevent those big spasms that occur that caught, lead to kind of acute uh, vasodilation uh, episodes and lead to those migraines. So um, acutely, if you were to give, say, a full dose preparing a lot of these patients, you might induce a headache, right? Um, so this is why you have to kind of start low with a lot of these therapies and go slow, right? So gently titrate it up so that way you do not induce sending migraine uh, for them because then otherwise you're just kind of fighting yourself when trying to give you know board of medications uh, when they had this preventative one already on board okay um, other things you might uh, think to help is uh, inhibiting serotonin release from platelets may help to in inhibit some of that adhesion that occurs there uh, so a couple of mechanisms is um, thought to be effective for preventing migraines uh, some anticonvulsants can also be used. So these are good for patients who maybe uh, have failed propranolol or if they uh, cannot take a beta blocker, this might be a good option for them. Uh, probably uh, valproic acid and its derivatives have the, the most evidence behind their use. Um, kind of thought to inhibit kind of this early wave of spread of the depression uh, that occurs when you have a, a migraine. Um, so that's gotten some use. You know, we, we talked about uh, valproic acid before and, and some of its other uses and, and kind of the side effects you're going to see there. Um, and then topamax or topiramate is probably another big one. Uh, so you being used very frequently for, for migraine prevention. Um, this one has lots of different uh, activities uh, thought to you know, block NMDA receptors by blocking those AMPA and kinate receptors, um, inhibits you know, sodium, calcium channels, and then also can uh, kind of lead to less activation of that trigeminal nerve. Um, so again, that's what's thought to lead to a lot of the pain associated with migraine. So a couple of different options there as far as um, anti-epileptics go. 
And then some antidepressants might be useful as well. So again, if they're just failing other therapies or they can't receive any of the other ones, so antidepressants might be useful. Um, tricyclic antidepressants uh, could be a good option for some patients. Um, Aminotriptyline probably has the most evidence behind its use out of the bunch, just because that one just tends to get used more than, than some of the other ones. Um, and then SSRIs are not frequently used. For some patients, they might just have worse and migraines due to this. Um, so again, this is not your, kind of your first line therapy for, for preventative uh, meds. And then some patients will use uh, calcium channel blockers. So verapamil is probably going to be the big one here. So again, using your non-dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers um, most frequently. So verapamil, um, you know, it's been shown to decrease frequency. Um, doesn't really affect the severity so much. Um, and, and some people feel it may actually have some good effects on, on preventing some of that aura from occurring in the first place. So that could be one option. And then um, nifedipine has some other options as well, so, or some other effects. Um, so nifedipine being what kind of calcium channel blocker? Yeah, that one is a dihydropyridine, right? So that's going to be working more preferentially on the vessel. So um, some people will use that uh, as well. So it's kind of just seeing what your patient responds to best. And again, you're going to be monitoring for you know recurrence of migraines. You're going to be seeing kind of looking at their headache diary uh, and seeing how frequently they're having those those events. And then you have botulinum toxin uh, or Botox, right? So how do you think that might work for preventing migraines? What does botulinum toxin do? <laughs> Paralyzes the muscle, right, because it prevents release of acetylcholine, so it can't interact with those uh, skeletal muscle uh, nicotinic receptors. How does that help a migraine? So again, when you have really tight like neck muscles and things like that that uh, are going into the head, so that can cause a lot of migraines and, and a lot of headaches for some patients. So if you can um, inject those muscles and kind of paralyze them, it may lead to less of those kind of tension kind of effects there. So for some patients who are, that's more their, their pathophysiology, that can be useful for them. So sometimes in rare cases, you'll see um, Botox being used for them. And you can use the extra and just make them look really pretty all the time and, you know. <laughs> Just kidding. Okay, um, so as I mentioned, start low, go slow. You do not want to induce a migraine for these patients. They will not uh, take very kindly to that. Um, and you can kind of consider it to be a success if the, the frequency, duration, or intensity has decreased by about 50% or more. Um, if you need to, um, you know, if you're, once you're kind of initiating therapy, try it for two to three months to see how they respond to it. Um, kind of give them time um, to see if it's going to work for them or not. And, you know, some cases it may make it worse and you just have to switch over to something else. Um, try to avoid any kind of interfering medications that could uh, have any um, you know, other effects. We talked about other things that can cause um, uh, migraines as well. So, like, caffeine is going to be a big one, alcohol, things like that. So try to avoid other interacting medications. Um and then also, you know, consider your kind of comorbidities, right? So they have really bad, you know, type 2 diabetes. Maybe a beta blocker is not the best option for them. Maybe calcium channel blocker is better, you know. Th so consider things like that. Okay. Um, so as far as migraines in, in females, you typically, we said you see a higher prevalence uh, in them. Uh, and so some of the clinical considerations you have to consider as well are, you know, uh, are they having issues related to uh, their menstrual cycle? Um, are they on oral contraceptives? Because uh, that can be uh, important. And then uh, things like, you know, pregnancy and then also kind of the post-hormonal phase or when they're in menopause, um, we'll see that can have some effects as well. So as far as menstrual migraines go, uh, about 14% of uh, female migraine sufferers are it's related to the menstrual cycle. Um, and so again, this kind of makes it a little bit easier in some regards because the attacks are pretty predictable. Um, and so it could be related back to kind of estrogen levels within the body. And so for them, you can actually see that by giving things like oral contraceptives, you may see some prevention of migraine for them, right? Kind of by keeping a more kind of um, set level of estrogen in the body um, that is able to kind of prevent some of those migraines from occurring. So um, that could be uh, one good thing to, to consider. Um, certainly, if you can predict when the uh, the migraines are going to occur, um, you can try using things like the trip dance, say like two or three days prior to onset, uh, and then continue for say five to seven days or so. Um, so that could be one option to help prevent the, the migraines from occurring in the first place. Um, you can see for some uh, patients who are taking oral contraceptives, this can actually make their migraines worse in some cases, right? So, um, you know, most women experience no changes, but there could be a subset of them that are going to either have uh, good effects, preventing migraines, some of them may have it uh, worsen. And so um, if the oral contraceptive is that's being used is either causing or increasing migraines, um, you can try using a different formulation of contraceptive or, or try decreasing the estrogen dose. That can be one thing that can help with that. Um, for some patients who do not really respond well to the estrogen component, you can try using progestin-only combinations uh, or products. Uh, and then um, 
you can see uh, if you can discontinue the oral contraceptive or decrease the number of estrogen withdrawals, they may actually help as well. Um, so say, for instance, every time they go on to the placebo part of the pack, um, they start to have a migraine. Well, if you maybe were to give them a product that says give them you know consistent estrogen for longer. So we talked about the season eek and the seasonals and things like that, where the patient may only have, you know, say, four periods a year. That may help to lead to, to less occurrence of migraines. So just kind of talk to your patient, kind of feel feel out with, with uh, them, you know, kind of what the onset is, what kind, what kind of, you know, time of the month it is, uh, and, and try to figure out, you know, if you need to either change your estrogen dose or just look at maybe continuing the estrogen for longer. Vitamin B6 is also thought to help with some of this. Um, so hopefully if they're taking like the prenatal vitamins and whatnot, they should be getting good doses of that already. Uh, if you have migraines during pregnancy, we'll see that uh, the drug of choice is always going to be acetaminophen, but uh, for patients who have really bad migraines, isn't acetaminophen going to work for them in a lot of cases? Probably not. It's just, you know, kind of using like homeopathic meds to try to, you know, cure cancer or something like that. Probably not going to work super well. Um, so some alternatives, uh, certainly opioids can potentially be used, especially short course uh, uh, of opioids. Triptans are category C, uh, as far as pregnancy categories go. So again, not a ton of great evidence to say that they're super uh, safe uh, for the, the fetus necessarily, but um, nothing to say that there's active uh, harm being done. Uh, but certainly uh, avoid NSAIDs in that third trimester of pregnancy. Do you guys remember why you want to avoid that? Yeah, it can close that, that ductus arteriosus early and can kind of lead to some uh, blood flow changes there you don't want to have happen uh, in, in the womb. Uh, and then the ergotamines are going to be category X, so just avoid those altogether. Okay, so kind of keep in mind where the patient's at during the pregnancy process and, and you can kind of tailor uh, your meds accordingly. Again, this is a big place where you can kind of look at patient counseling and education and seeing like what their triggers are and see if they can avoid a lot of those things. Um, like I know my, my wife, when she's pregnant, like her, she has a sensitive nose anyway, but like it just got turned up to 11 when she was pregnant. And so just any particular smells could just set her off and have a pretty bad headache, uh, a lot of nausea and vomiting associated with it. So try to find those triggers. Uh, hopefully it's not their husband. Uh, otherwise they may have to go sleep in a different room for a while. I'm just kidding. But that didn't happen, um, but it could occur. Um, and again, as far as preventative things go, you know, try to use non-pharmacologic therapy as, as much as possible. Um, obviously, less meds in these patients, the better. Uh, and then moving on to speaking uh, specifically about tension headaches. Um, so these are going to be, uh, you know, just kind of run of the mill type of headaches. These can be um, treated most often with just over the counter kind of acute um, uh, analgesics. So, you know, your NSAIDs, acetaminophen, things like Excedrin, just kind of, you know, usually some combination uh, of medications there. Um, and then some patients, uh, especially with kind of recurrent tension headaches, they may uh, respond to a combination drug called uh, Fioracet or Fioranol. Um, so a little bit different formulations there. So um, you'll see a lot of patients who will be on uh, a combination of acetaminophen, caffeine and butalbital, so that's Fioracet. I remember that because acetaminophen uh, is in that combination, so that's CET, you know, it goes with the acetaminophen. Uh, and the Fioranol, AL, is going to have the aspirin uh, component, so it's aspirin, caffeine, and butalbital. Now, um, butalbital is actually a barbiturate, um, so it's very similar in activity to uh, phenobarb. It's just not very potent. Um, it's kind of a kind of a wimpy barbiturate, if anything. Um, but uh, they find uh, that it's you know, equal to, to placebo in a lot of cases. Uh, and for some patients, may actually have rebound headaches. So I see a lot of patients who are using this very frequently. I don't see a whole lot of benefit that actually uh, being used. So uh, just something to consider. Um, usually try to limit it to, to use just twice weekly. Um, you know, they may need to look at uh, some you know, kind of preventative medications or, or therapies. Uh, if they're using it more frequently than that. These are prescriptions? These are going to be prescriptions, yeah, if you're set and if you're on all, yep. And it's one of those things, if you ever see a patient, if you do a urine drug screen on a patient uh, and they show positive for barbiturates, um, because it is so infrequent that people are abusing these drugs um, for, you know, getting high purposes and things like that, um, uh, check to see if they have migraines or if they have headaches. Uh, chances are they're probably on Fioracet. Um, that would explain it. So butalbital is not something a lot of people think of as being a barbiturate, but uh, you can at least ask them and kind of solve that mystery. So to speak. So um, for them, preventative things that can help, uh, TCAs, amitriptyline uh, being kind of chief among them, um, some SSRIs. You're going to find that SSRIs are going to have less side effects than the TCAs because, again, they have a much more specific mechanism of action, um, but typically are going to be less effective overall um, than your TCAs. Um, and then also some things that can help, things like smoking cessation um, can also maybe help to lead to less headaches. And then for cluster headaches, because cluster headaches are 
really kind of significant headaches. Um, very, very, uh, very, very painful. Um, you're going to see that uh, it's slightly different than migraines, but the therapy actually ends up being pretty similar. Um, so they actually recommend using things like abortive therapies like ergotamines, um, DHE uh, can be useful here, uh, triptans. Uh, so very similar uh, methods of treatment as you would see for a migraine. Um, some patients uh, respond well to oxygen. Um, so by increasing oxygen flow to the brain, this may help some of their headaches. So um, that could be one option for them as well. Uh, for them, prophylaxis, uh, verapamil tends to be very, very effective for them. So if they have a history of cluster headaches, verapamil might be a better option than, say, something like propranolol. Um, some patients have responded well to lithium in the past, but we know there's lots of kind of side effects with that one. So we try to avoid that if we can, uh, since verapamil is kind of a better uh, ADR kind of profile. Um, you may see some patients be on kind of prophylactic ergotamines, but that's kind of gone by the wayside as we have kind of better medications for that. Um, and then uh, corticosteroids, um, not really good for long-term therapy, again, just due to adverse effects. So really, verapamil is probably the go-to um, medication for patients with these cluster headaches. So any questions on, now that I've induced a migraine, so probably most of you, any questions about that? You guys all know what to go take now. All right. So moving on, uh, we're going to speak about rheumatology. So you guys have covered at least a little bit of this uh, previously, correct? Yep. All right. So, uh, what is uh, I guess what what is rheumatoid arthritis? What is it? It's an autoimmune disease. Okay, good. So that means what? Yep. It means you need to take a lot of steroids. So you can tell someone has RA when they're like super buff and they can't even fit through the door right now. <laughs> no, not those kind of steroids. So what is it? It's a destruction of the synovial capsule. Right. And so, so essentially the body can't tell itself from, from kind of foreign antigens, right? So uh, the problem is you have an overactive immune system uh, that's causing all this inflammation. So we need to deal with that inflammation. So um, you're absolutely right. We're going to see, especially with RA, you're going to have a lot of uh, destruction of the joint. Um, we're going to kind of talk about RA and osteoarthritis kind of uh, kind of side by side just to kind of compare and contrast um, their, their pathophysiology and see why the, the medical therapy for that is going to differ so greatly. So, um, you know, again, usually our body can, uh, you know, look at foreign or antigenic substances and respond appropriately to that, but you end up losing that um, in some of these uh, rheumatologic conditions. And so, especially when we look at some of the disease modifying therapy, you're going to see that it is very um, similar uh, between different autoimmune conditions. So, whether you're dealing with lupus or you're dealing with, say, um, you know, uh, some kind of glomerular nephritis, or if you're dealing with um, whatever kind of, you know, UC or um, uh, Crohn's disease, you're going to see a lot of the same kind of disease modifying therapy popping up here because um, the pathophysiology is all the same, it's just the manifestations are differing here. Um, so from that standpoint, you know, we're, we're trying to deal with inflammation and, and the drugs are going to be very similar to one another. So, um, again, this chronic inflammation is where we're going to see a lot of destruction uh, of joint tissue, uh, especially with, with RA. You're going to see how that differs a lot with, with osteoarthritis and how that's more of a kind of a mechanical kind of uh, problem that's coming up. So, um, other issues that are happening here, so the cell damage is occurring from the inflammation. We have lots of um, leukocytes being kind of migrated to the area of inflammation, releasing all these lysosomal enzymes. Um, and you're also going to see a lot of arachidonic acid being uh, liberated here, right? So we know arachidonic acid is, is important in producing things like prostaglandins and leukotrienes and all those kind of other uh, inflammatory cytokines. So you can already start to see where some of the drugs are going to be using to treat this uh, are kind of coming into play here. And so um, also when you have this neutrophil stimulation, it leads to a lot of free radical formulation. So we have a lot of H2O2 or what's that? Oh, it's called hydrogen peroxide, right? So that kind of breaks up into kind of these free radical um, hydroxyl groups that can go around, denature proteins and destroy cells and have all kinds of bad problems. Um, and it just kind of helps perpetuate further inflammation. So uh, really we're going to be looking at different drugs and kind of where they're working at in the kind of inflammatory cycle. Um, obviously you're going to know that the gold standard for dealing with inflammation is going to be our corticosteroids because that's going to be working at the level of the nucleus to decrease the uh, transcription of those inflammatory uh, mediators. So, um, Again, here when you're looking at uh, our inflammatory pathway, you guys have seen slides similar to this before, um, but obviously the the arachidonic acid is being liberated from these uh, the cell membranes. Um, looking at something like a steroid, a corticosteroid working here, kind of at the top of the pyramid uh, to decrease inflammation. So we're going to see that those drugs will be very, very potent for dealing with that, but obviously we know there's lots of side effects associated with them as well. And then our old friend cyclooxygenase is going to come back here. Um, so obviously we're going to be focusing on drugs that inhibit that. So obviously our NSAIDs are going to be very useful for that. Um, not as much uh, really activity in the 5 lipoxygenase pathway, but we know that's important for things like asthma and whatnot. 
So um, with RA, we know this is going to be this chronic inflammatory disease is characterized uh, usually by symmetrical uh, joint involvement. Um, usually some extra articular manifestations uh, can occur as well. Um, and you normally you're going to see this in uh, you know, females typically, usually occurring in the you know, 30s to 40s. Um, and oftentimes it's going to be you know, diagnosed based on, on the clinical features you're kind of uh, witnessing in them. And um, we're going to see this joint destruction that occurs. What are kind of the, the most common joints that end up getting affected? The hands are a big one. Wrist. I had one, uh, I was in uh, elementary school, and I remember I, I didn't know what it was at the time, but this one lady had just horrible RA, and like her hands were just, you know, basically just kind of going off at almost a 90 degree angle. Um, so very, very, very uh, debilitating for a lot of patients. And so um, this is why we're going to see that, um, you know, do any of our medications actually reverse the effects of RA? No. We're going to see that we can slow the progression, but we cannot reverse things. So this is why early treatment is going to be so important for these patients um, and why kind of catching things early is, is best. But again, you know, if you're basing it just off clinical signs and symptoms, um, it may be hard to kind of catch those patients that early. So um, you know, when you have this chronic inflammation of the synovial tissue, this line in that joint capsule, um, you're going to see this uh, kind of inflamed synovium or this panis that develops, cause a lot of the, the kind of deformation of the, the joints there. Um, and you're going to see the panis start to invade the cartilage and start to destroy some of that bone surface. Uh, so I'll show some pictures of that in a second. Uh, but basically, the immune system is not uh, differentiating itself from foreign material, uh, and so we're having this kind of inappropriate immune response. So um, there's also some humoral components as well. Um, so this is where you get the formation of antibodies, and this is going to be uh, derived from your B lymphocytes. We're going to see some drugs that work against that specifically. Um, and you also have these antibodies formed that are called these rheumatoid factors. Um, and this would be nice. Uh, there are some of these we can use as diagnostic tests to kind of determine um, kind of progression of disease and things like that. But again, they're all kinds of signs of inflammation. So. Um, Again, these B cells are going to be produced, uh, um, produce plasma cells that form the antibodies, uh, and then you're going to see this helps to activate the complement system uh, that will attract the uh, neutrophils to the site of inflammation. So we're going to see, uh, I mentioned all these points uh, just because some of the disease-modifying therapy we're going to use is going to be targeting specific components of this, whether it be uh, targeting the B cells or it be t targeting certain cytokines like tumor necrosis factor. You're going to see these uh, come up again uh, as we move forward. So, and again, the T cells are going to be um, also very prominent here. So again, they're responsible for having a lot of direct cell to cell contact uh, to continue this inflammation uh, cascade. And this is where things like interleukins can come into play and tumor necrosis factor <clears throat> can become very important here um, for that intercell signaling. So if we can inhibit that some way, say by binding up all your TNF, you inhibit those T cells from interacting with one another, hopefully it can kind of halt that, that inflammation. And then you see a lot of the uh, histamine being released here, a lot of prostaglandins being developed. So this is where corticosteroids, NSAIDs can be useful because you're going to deal with things like, you know, the warmth, the edema that's uh, developing there. And so the CD receptors are also going to come up very frequently uh, as we'll have drugs that specifically target the CD receptors. And so you're blocking that, you can prevent any further kind of communication happening from cell to cell. Okay, so I'm sure you guys have seen pictures very similar to this before. Um, essentially, you can just start to see some of that degradation of the bone and, and the cartilage that's occurring here. And again, this is all due to inflammation versus like something like osteoarthritis. How would you kind of characterize that uh, damage being done? Hmm? Yeah, so it's, it's kind of a more mechanical issue, right? So it's kind of overuse of the joint. You're eventually just having kind of bone grinding its bone, uh, causing a lot of that damage occurring there uh, with over degradation of the, the cartilage and whatnot. So here's again, is, uh, the pathophysiology is so much different and that's why we're gonna see that the therapies are gonna differ pretty greatly between the two. So um, again, we know osteoarthritis is gonna be kind of the most common form of joint disease, especially for uh, middle-aged and older patients. Uh, it's affecting tons and tons of people. We see lots of, um, you know, issues with uh, loss of, of productivity, lots of uh, changes in ability to do active day living, quality of life, all gets affected um, by osteoarthritis. Um, and typically you end up seeing a lot of uh, differences in the joints that get affected. Here you see a lot of hip and, and knee replacements being done for these patients because those um, obviously get a lot of overuse uh, for patients just being up and walking around and throughout their lives. So if you just uh, kind of compare uh, the two together, you can see here just kind of what they look like to one another. So osteoarthritis is just due to that kind of overuse of the joint leading to um, destruction of the, the cartilage and whatnot, and just kind of that uh, all those pain fibers being uh, sensitized and kind of you have more of the mechanical kind of bone on bone uh, action occurring here versus here uh, in, in rheumatoid arthritis is all just inflammation. So you see a lot of kind of enlargement of that joint there just due to the, um, you know, kind of the, the chemotaxis and the kind of the, the uh, for the propagation of inflammation that occurs there.
Okay. So arth osteoarthritis, obviously, we know things like the hands can still be affected, but a lot of large joints like the, the hips and the knees also get affected pretty uh, significantly. Um, and so, as you might imagine, uh, is there anything that we can do to help reverse the effects of osteoarthritis for these patients? Can we reverse the progression of disease? Yeah, again, there might be one thing that we can use to help kind of um, reverse some effects, but again, it's not going to be super useful. Like kind of what's the, the end-all therapy for um, osteoarthritis? Yeah, just replace the whole joint, right? Um, so you're going to see that we uh, we don't have as much disease-modifying therapy either for osteoarthritis. So there's not a lot of stuff we can do to necessarily slow uh, the progression of disease because, again, it's all mechanical. So a lot of it is, you know, well, if you stop using the joint, you'd be fine, right? Well, people got to walk, right? So, uh, so it's kind of... Uh, one of those things where, uh, you know, it's just going to happen. It's just one of those things that with aging. So you can kind of look at the, the differences that are occurring here. Again, I'm not going to get super in-depth in on this, um, but just realize that uh, we're not going to have a lot of things that are disease-modifying necessarily. Um, really, we're going to be looking more at symptomatic management for this. So just dealing with the pain they're experiencing. Um, there'll be some drugs that we're going to work a little bit more specifically to um, potentially help kind of... Um, replace you know synovial lining and things like that or try to um, you give a better lubrication uh, in the joint but we'll look at that as we move forward okay so again uh, our goals for therapy are pretty similar uh, between the two here so for ra and oa we're going to be looking at to relieve pain and stiffness and uh, reduce any inflammation so specifically with oa if it's a, if it's present right because we're going to see some use for corticosteroids and osteoarthritis but it's going to be much more directed much more targeted than you see with rheumatoid um, and again, we'd like to improve function, improve quality of life, and slow that joint damage uh, if at all possible. And then for rheumatoid arthritis specifically, you'd like to uh, have remission of, of symptoms and slow disease progression. This is why our therapies differ so much here, because at least with RA, you can kind of slow progression of disease. Okay. Uh, Non-pharmacologic therapy, so obviously uh, PT, OT is going to be critical for a lot of these patients. Obviously, you know, uh, a lot of it can be painful for them, so uh, compliance with this is not super great. Um, weight loss can be huge, especially for osteoarthritis. It takes a lot of pressure off those joints there. Um, and some assistive devices, things like ice, heat can, can be useful as well. And obviously, you know, especially for uh, osteoarthritis, surgery is going to be kind of end-all therapy there. Um, just kind of looking at the com uh, comparison of pharmacologic therapy that we'd use between RA and OA. Um, obviously, you're going to use a lot of things that uh, decrease inflammation with RA. So this is where uh, for chronic treatment of inflammation, you're going to see your NSAIDs are going to be useful here. Uh, Low-dose corticosteroids are going to be kind of, uh, and normally we say, you know, don't use low, uh, kind of chronic corticosteroids. But for this disease state, this is one of the few ones where you will uh, probably end up having to use kind of low-dose uh, steroids as kind of maintenance therapy. A lot of cases you're going to see it being used more for um, kind of disease flare-ups. And it'll still be used in that case here, um, but this is more commonly you're going to see being used kind of daily uh, for, for prevention or dealing with that inflammation. And then um, look at our DMARDs. Does anyone know what a DMARD is? This is modifying anti yeah, so disease modifying anti rheumatic drugs. We'll talk about those as we go forward. Um, and then potentially you can have, uh, especially if you have specific things like knee effusions, um, you can have aspiration of the fluid and then uh, corticosteroid injection. Um, I'll never forget, I was in uh, the, the PZD. We actually had a, a kid who came in who had juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, and they actually had one of the, the um, rheumatologists come down uh, and, and uh, aspirate the joint and then actually in, injected the corticosteroids. So I was you know, delivering the, the corticosteroids at the time. Um, you know, we were using uh, trimcinolone. Uh, I'll never forget just how much fluid he was able to pull out of this like, little kid's knee. It was like 180 cc's or something like crazy. And the kid felt way better afterwards. So all the pressure was going off the joint. But uh, then we got to inject the corticosteroids and, and uh, hopefully that helped them feel a little bit better. But yeah, you can have very, very uh, big, big joints uh, just due to the fluid accumulation there. But anywho, uh, on the other hand, uh, looking at osteoarthritis, you're going to see more use for things like acetaminophen. So you can see that being used uh, pretty commonly for patients with OA. Um, you're going to see, especially if you have more kind of localized disease and very few joints are being affected, you can actually use some topical analgesics. We'll talk about those a little bit later. Um, and then for kind of acute exacerbations, this is where more... Um, uh, Opioids are going to be coming into play. Obviously, you'd want to stay away from chronic opioids whenever possible, but uh, a lot of patients end up having, uh, especially um, you know, the more chronic patients are definitely going to be uh, having some need for, for chronic use of opioids. And then uh, here you can also see very targeted use of corticosteroids, specifically in, in individual joints. Uh, so we'll talk about some use of that a little bit later. 
So um, for RA, we look at the disease-modifying anti-rheumatic drugs. Uh, you're going to see that we have some of the older agents, which will be non-biologic, and then you're going to look at our uh, monoclonal antibodies, uh, which are going to be our biologic DMARDs. Um, these are going to be the cornerstone of therapy. Almost every patient should be on at least one of these um, and need to be initiated as early as possible because they help to pre prevent that progression of disease. Um, you start earlier with these, you end up seeing better favorable outcomes for your patients. And then uh, NSAIDs and corticosteroids are only going to be useful for uh, immediate symptomatic relief. Uh, you know, obviously they'll be on some of these chronically, um, but not really doing anything with disease progression. Only the DMARDs are really helping with that. Okay. So uh, first off, we'll talk about our traditional DMARDs. Again, these are non-biologic agents. Uh, it's important to make that distinction because it'll be important for certain uh, adverse effects and certain uh, usually kind of pre pre-initiation kind of uh, testing you want to be doing beforehand. So I'm sure you guys have heard about that, so we'll talk about that when we get to the biologics. Anyway, uh, the four main ones you're going to see used here include methotrexate, hydroxychloroquine, sulfasalazine, and leflunamide. So, uh, and then you have your biologic uh, DMARs. You're going to have infliximab, uh, cerdolizumab, etanercept, adalimumab, and golimumab. These are all going to be your anti-TNF DMARs. Uh, so again, they're specifically monoclonal antibodies for the most part um, that are targeted against TNF. So it binds up TNF and it prevents it from activating for their cellular inf inflammation. Um, we're going to see some drugs. Uh, we'll talk about this co-stimulation modulator, which is a batacept. And then we'll talk about a few um, IL-6 uh, antagonists. Actually, that is a, a typo. Rituximab is not a uh, IL-6 receptor antagonist. I forgot to correct this. Um, that actually will be an antibody against CD20. Um, the slide when we get to rituximab is correct, though, so just don't go off of this one. Um, and then we'll also talk about a newer agent. Uh, it's called tofacitinib, or Zelljans. Um, this one is actually not really a biologic DMARD. It uh, has kind of a novel mechanism. We'll look at this, uh, this jack. Um, a protein and in, in inhibiting this uh, protein. So we'll look at that when we get to that one in just a minute. So um, some other agents you might use to say for like say more refractory patients will have drugs like um, azathioprine, um, which sometimes you'll see being used for patients who have uh, transplant uh, to prevent rejection. Um, cyclosporin against another big one you'll see used there. Um, we actually used to use gold compounds. Uh, gold used to be uh, used and inhibit inflammatory cells, but obviously it led to some um, some, uh, some significant side effects. We don't really use gold anymore. Um, also, it's very, very expensive, as you might imagine. Actually, I don't know what the price is, but um, for your bougie or patients, they might request the gold, but say, no, you don't actually want those. Um, uh, and yeah, so those are the main ones. And then we see like cyclophosphamide. Do um, you guys remember where else we use that? Yeah, for cancer, right? So sometimes you can, you can use uh, these drugs to just basically just kill off all of your immune cells, and that can help decrease the inflammation. So uh, again, more for your refractory patients. And again, you'll see things like cyclophosphamide sometimes being used for non-rheumatologic conditions. Um, so we'll have that, you know, for things like especially like really bad like um, glomerulonephritis is due to uh, an autoimmune condition. Like we'll see it used sometimes with that. I'm trying to think anywhere else I've seen it being used. Doesn't it have it does have some bladder toxicity associated with it, so you got to be careful. Yeah, so that's kind of the thing where you have, um, you want to make sure like the right type of practitioners are using it appropriately. Like you obviously don't want like your hospitalist ordering cyclophosphamide for, for kidney stuff because, you know, it's just not really their, their ballpark, right? So, um, so if you ever see something like a nephrologist using cyclophosphamide, um, that could make sense under the right circumstances. So just kind of take it um, that into consideration. Okay, um, so general considerations for our DMARDs, we don't have a ton of ideas of how this specifically works uh, for these disease states. Um, you're going to see that um, these take time to work. They're not going to be immediate uh, effect like you would see for something like, you know, uh, corticosteroids, uh, which would work much more quickly. Um, they're going to take time. And so for the non-biologics, you're going to see the methotrexate and hydroxychloroquine have typically the best efficacy to toxicity ratio. Um, usually you're going to see with your, uh, your biologics, they work very, very well. Um, they're very, very specific in their mechanisms of action, so they limit a lot of the systemic side effects you see with things like methotrexate. Um, they're also going to be a lot more expensive, um, uh, and, and we'll see some other issues with them as well. But as far as non-biologics, you know, methotrexate and hydroxychloroquine are going to be the two kind of go-to ones. You can have patients, um, especially if they're on, say, methotrexate and corticosteroids, um, you can see them uh, be kind of stable on this combination for, for some period of time. So as they grow in the five years, um, you're still going to come back and they're still you know, kind of trucking along just fine on the methotrexate. So um, this is a very commonly, especially early on in the disease, you may see patients on this. Um, 
in some cases you're going to have to use multiple drugs at the same time and so there's going to be some considerations on which drugs it makes sense to kind of combine with one another and so you may see multiple um, non-biologic DMARDs being mixed together you may see a non-biologic and a biologic being used um, but typically you're never going to see two biologics being used at the same time so it's kind of a general rule of thumb and there might be some questions on a test that come up say like okay which one of these um, it would not be a recommended therapy for you know a patient with you know progressive rheumatoid arthritis, right? And so you wouldn't use two biologics at the same time. So I'll, I'll kind of reiterate that um, as we move forward. Uh, methotrexate typically should be used for most patients uh, with rheumatoid arthritis. Again, has better long-term data. Uh, it's been around probably the longest out of the bunch. Um, and it's going to have uh, kind of a good backbone component to a lot of other regimens. So if you have to use multiple drugs, it's always uh, okay to have methotrexate on. It's kind of a backbone uh, component of that. So um, traditional DMARDs you're going to see have a kind of slow onset of action. So it can take three to six months before you really start to see any kind of symptomatic improvement. But again, these are going to be more used for kind of the long game here. So we're trying to help prevent progression of disease for those patients. Um, some of them may work a little bit faster. So say something like methotrexate, sulfasalazine, leflunamide may, you know, say work in one to two months. But it's important to let your patients know that, hey, it could take even longer, uh, especially if they're, you know, just happen to be uh, one of those ones that are predisposed to, to taking longer. With the biologic, you're going to see a lot quicker onset of action. Um, so usually within a few weeks or so, you should see some some decent effects there. So that's kind of one benefit of using the biologics. Um, now, as far as uh, you know, all of these drugs are going to cause immunosuppression. So what do you kind of worry about as a complication of that? You worry about infection, right? And so the other thing you worry about is if you have a patient who has a latent TB infection, you can have reactivation of that uh, or activation of that with biologic DMARDs. So that's why it's very, very important uh, that you look at a patient's TB status before starting a biologic DMARD, okay? So any of the MABs, you want to do a TB test beforehand. Um, and then you should also consider uh, if their vaccinations are up to date or not. Okay. Um, so for instance, um, we haven't talked about vaccines specifically, but um, there's kind of two big um, kind of divides between them. You have kind of live attenuated, which means the, the virus or the bacteria itself is actually active, but it's kind of a weaker version of it. Or you have killed off or say like a partial um, uh, vaccine. So if you imagine if you were to give say a live vaccine to a patient who's on say some pretty significant immunosuppression what do you think might happen yeah they'll have actual the, the disease you're giving them right so uh, imagine if you were to give say uh, a live attenuated uh, attenuated just means a weaker version uh, of the flu vaccine to one of these patients who's on a biologic DMARD and you know kind of um, suppressing their immune system they may develop the flu right um, on the other hand if you were to give say like a, a killed or an inactivated one um, what do you think might happen if you were to uh, you know try to vaccinate someone who's on one of these biologic DMARDs Yeah, so they don't matter as good of an immune response. So you may not see. And so uh, one of the things we'll talk about is the durability of response to vaccines, meaning how long do you uh, remain immune to something? Um, and the durability is not very good with uh, if you're on one of these uh, biology DMARD. So um, it's always best to give vaccines before you start therapy uh, whenever possible. And then uh, if they're on biologic DMARD therapy, never want to give them a live vaccine. Okay. Well, again, we'll reiterate that in just a little bit. So, um, or we'll do it right now. Um, so again, um, you give them beforehand, especially with the, the biologics, whenever possible. Um, but, you know, things like the pneumococcal, the intramuscular flu, the hep B, um, those can be given drug therapy during therapy. You just may not see, um, you know, as good of a response. But again, it's still important to make sure they're, they're well vaccinated. Um, Lives are not going to be recommended for biologic or people who are on biologics. Um, and they, uh, the American College of Rheumatology actually recommends specifically that they get the herpes zoster uh, a little bit earlier, so say at age 50 rather than age 60 normally, just due to that immunosuppression that's happening there. That's one of the recommendations they make for those patients. Um, so, if, and then that can be important, especially if you know, um, obviously you want to keep them up to date on their their flu vaccine every year, and especially if they're on kind of chronic therapy, uh, because like you know the intranasal. Uh, the, the flu mist is actually the live attenuated version, so they always have to get the, the IM uh, version of the flu shot. So things like that, you know, things to consider um, for these patients. Okay, um, so the first kind of traditional DMARD we'll get into is going to be methotrexate. Um, this one is working. We've seen this before, right? We talked about chemotherapy. Um, does anyone remember how this drug works? Folic acid, something, something. Yeah, that's. 
50%, right? So basically we're inhibiting the actions of folic acid, okay? Folic acid is necessary to produce things like purines and help to, uh, when cells are dividing, to help, you know, kind of produce new DNA, right? So by inhibiting that process, by inhibiting uh, dihydrofolate reductase, specifically that enzyme, you cannot activate folic acid to its active form, which is, anyone know what the active form of folic acid is? Folinic acid. acid, right? Other, any other names for that? Leucovorin, right? So leucovorin is also known as folinic acid. So basically the cells can't produce folinic acid and they cannot uh, go on to, to use the rest of that cycle, right? Um, so by doing that, you kind of inhibit the uh, inflammatory cells from, from replicating and you depress the immune system uh, from that standpoint, okay? So just a picture kind of showing the, the process here where methotrexate looks very similar to folic acid, it looks very similar to things like tetrahydrofolate, and basically just blocking that enzyme, the dihydrofolate reductase, and preventing new production of those uh, things like purines and whatnot. So, um, because of the fact that it's not working specifically just on cells that are, say, affecting the rheumatoid, or, uh, the rheumatoid arthritic joints, um, you're going to see systemic toxicity. A lot of that can be manifest as things like bone marrow suppression, right? So it's going to be important for monitoring, uh, looking at your CBCs, especially, you know, uh, looking at uh, risk for infection and things like that. Um, you know, rapidly dividing cells in the GI tract can be affected as well. Um, so GI and oral epithelial ulceration of stomatitis. And if you were to compare doses of methotrexate for cancer versus for rheumatoid arthritis, how would you compare them? Yeah. The doses are much lower in rheumatoid arthritis than you would see with uh, treatment for cancer, right? Um, so while these effects are going to be lessened, uh, they're not going to be non-existent. So just be aware of that it could be just less severe or maybe not pop up for these patients, depending on uh, kind of what their sensitivities are, um, and especially if you're mixing multiple meds at the same time. Um, obviously, a lot of GI toxicity, so you can see a lot of nausea vomiting. Um, hepatotoxicity can be another big thing, so you definitely want to monitor for um, you know, any kind of rises in LFTs, things like that. Obviously, you know, drinking concurrently can be uh, problematic for patients who already have kind of bad livers to begin with. Um, some pulmonary toxicity, so lots of other issues. And then obviously you want to make sure that they are, uh, your monitor renal function as well. So again, that can be a big thing where you can have precipitation and cause, um, uh, you know, acute kidney injury. Uh, so make sure they're staying well hydrated while being on this drug. Obviously, it's going to be contraindicated during pregnancy. Um, category X will definitely cause uh, the fetus to do not uh, survive. Um, make sure you're giving this for patient or avoiding patients who have kind of significant renal insufficiency or chronic liver disease. And then if they already have pre-existing kind of blood dyscrasias, that's obviously just going to worsen it. So uh, methotrexate is going to be the most commonly used DMARD out there, right? So most patients will end up getting started on this kind of first. Um, it's going to have pretty effective therapy, uh, pretty pretty quick acting as compared to some of the other uh, biologics, um, and, and pretty acceptable uh, incidence of side effects, especially um, the fact that you're using a lot lower doses than you'd see with the, for those you know, kind of cancer indications. A um, couple different options as far as administration goes. So you can give it uh, PO, uh, subcutaneously, intramuscularly, any of those will work. Um, some patients you may see only on, say, like subcutaneous, doses once a week or um, you know, so it may not be an everyday therapy they're actually receiving. And so um, this can be problematic, especially for older patients. I remember I had one lady who um, called at the poison center and she was giving herself subcutaneous injections of methotrexate. And, you know, as you get older, obviously your memory starts to go a little bit. And so she had accidentally given herself like uh, a second dose because she forgot she'd done that one already that morning. Um, so obviously you can have some issues there. Uh, our patients may, you know, need to really be sure they're, they're kind of keeping on top of that therapy. So uh, monitor for things like uh, your CBC, look at LFTs, look at your creatinine in a baseline, and kind of monitor uh, throughout to make sure that they're not having kind of significant effects from that. Okay. Uh, obviously, pregnancy status, if that is a concern for you have a younger patient uh, who is still childbearing potential. And then uh, we'll give folic acid, uh, either one milligram once a day, or you can actually give seven milligrams uh, once weekly um, to kind of help limit some of those more uh, systemic toxicities, right? Try to help kind of spare some of the healthy cells, okay? This is uh, preventing the conversion of folic acid to folinic acid. How come just throwing more folic acid helps? Yeah, you're right. Um, so in a lot of cases, like, so say for instance, we had like a methotrexate overdose, um, you get folinic acid, acid right? Because you need to rescue all those kind of healthy cells. This is more just kind of a preventative, like hopefully some of the healthy cells will kind of be spared and still able to use some of that folic acid. So it's trying to oversaturate. Yeah, just make sure that they're kind of topped off, so to speak, so that the ones that are able to use it can. Because again, you're using lower doses, so you're not going to see as um, kind of a widespread effect as you would for like you know, chemotherapy or something. But um, yeah, you're right. Normally,
normally it doesn't make sense to, to give the inactive form because a lot of the cells will not be able to utilize it. You're just really trying to top them off and trying to help um, keep as many of the healthy cells kind of in check as you can. So uh, then moving on, you have leflunamide. Uh, this is going to be working by inhibiting that pyrimidine synthesis. Um, it's going to decrease that lymphocyte proliferation and also uh, it's, a, it's a pro drug actually, so you can give it, uh, it'll be biologically converted uh, to this active form. So again, if you inhibit pyrimidine synthesis, you cannot uh, uh, form new DNA, thus the cells cannot replicate. Um, you can see efficacy is pretty comparable to the methotrexate. Um, as far as efficacy goes, and it's still pretty pretty quick acting. So usually, when that about a month or so, hopefully, you start to see some of the effects. But again, always make sure you let them know that it may take three to six months before you really see full effects there. Uh, as far as adverse effects go, uh, most commonly you're going to see is going to be diarrhea associated with this, which can be problematic for some of your patients, and very similar kind of immunosuppression, uh, hepatotoxicity, hematologic toxicity. You're going to see all of that same effects as you with from methotrexate. Um, the thing you have to remember with leflunamide, and this is very similar to um, uh, a drug we talked about uh, for MS, uh, is that you're going to see uh, this enteropathic recirculation. So if you have a patient who would consider getting pregnant, um, it takes a long time for them to actually drop down to undetectable levels in the blood. Okay, um, you guys remember what that enteropathic recirculation is? What is that? Yeah. Yeah, so the drug gets kicked out of the biliary tract and gets reabsorbed from the GI tract. So uh, that would make sense why we can give a drug cholestyramine as a bilateral sequestrant and combine up the drug and allow it to be uh, eliminated through the feces. Okay, um, so that could be one thing to do, especially for patients you're um, they're considered to be uh, getting pregnant, or if you have um, someone who's having toxicity and they need to get rid of the drug a little bit faster. Uh, obviously, the monitoring is going to be very similar to what you see with the uh, methotrexate. Not as much about real kidney issues you would see with methotrexate is going to be one, one thing you're kind of spared there. Yes? I'm sorry, why did you say the cholesterol is just to bind it? Yeah, so um, uh, kind of normally it's a bilateral sequestrum, but it can help bind up the drug as it gets kicked out of the biliary tract and kind of get rid of it, uh, prevent it from being reabsorbed. Uh, next up, hydroxychloroquine. This is probably the wimpiest out of the bunch of the traditional DMARDs, but it's also going to have the least amount of side effects associated with it. Okay, so it could be good for some patients who have very mild disease, uh, who maybe don't need the full kind of effect of methotrexate. Um, can be used either uh, by itself or in combination, especially with either a biologic or other non-biologic DMARDs. Um, so it can be good in combination. And again, this one is going to be working by inhibiting uh, neutrophil locomotion, so actually prevents them from kind of getting to the site of inflammation. Um, and it will also help to kind of impair uh, this kind of complement dependent antigen antibody reactions there. So it kind of helps to prevent the cells from really kind of doing their, their duty. Um, and so because you're not really having as much immunosuppression, you're going to see not as uh, kind of potent of effects here. Uh, but again, you're also going to see less toxicity. This is going to take a little bit longer to work, say two to four months or so. Um, and But you really don't see a ton of myelosuppression, uh, renal insufficiency, or hepatotoxicity. So there's less monitoring associated with it, but just may not be effective for more patients who have kind of, you know, moderate to severe disease. Um, can see some GI effects, so certainly take it with food, yes. So it says um, that you can use this as a combination. Mm -hmm. No, no, no. So just saying that it's uh, good to use in combination because of the fact that it has kind of limited toxicities. Um, so say, for instance, you had someone who's on methotrexate and they're really not getting the full, getting some benefit, but not as much as you want. You could potentially add on hydroxychloroquine, right? Or you can use this along with like some of the biologics. So um, because, again, obviously you don't want to have like multiple oh, drugs that cause. The biologics that you can't use it. That's yeah, you don't want to use two biologics together. Yep. So um, some other kind of unique side effects you'll see with hydroxychloroquine, you can actually see some retinopathy here. Um, so if a patient compare, you know, complains of any kind of blurred vision or any kind of visual changes, you definitely want to get that checked out uh, immediately. Uh, and you can also see some dermatologic issues. Um, you see this kind of increased skin pigmentation that can occur, um, which is may or may not be reversible for your patients. Uh, so that can be problematic for them as well. Uh, and then we have sulfazalazine. You guys remember where we used this before? 
we got Crohn's and ulcerative colitis, right? So again, um, similar drugs are seen being used for these autoimmune conditions because uh, again, the pathophysiology is essentially going to be the, the same here. But uh, sulfasalazine, uh, you know, it's a pro drug, it gets uh, converted into uh, sulfapyridine, that 5 amino salicylic acid, by the colonic bacteria. Um, and so uh, I don't know the full mechanism here either, but uh, it's thought to you know inhibit things like TNF or tumor necrosis factor, which can be useful to decrease inflammation uh, and also can uh, potentially work. It's kind of a free radical scavenger and kind of binding up those kind of free floating hydroxyl groups to prevent you know kind of further damage from being done. Um, this one may work uh, somewhat quickly, you know, within a month or so, but some patients may have delayed uh, onset of uh, efficacy. Uh, a lot of patients are going to have some uh, toxicity associated with this, um, so just you know, start at low doses, kind of gently titrate up, see kind of what they tolerate, uh, just support you know things uh, supportively, especially in the nausea, vomiting, etc. Um, usually, don't see a ton of myelosuppression here, so that could be one benefit to this drug. Uh, but you do have to consider uh, drug interaction. So, for instance, if I mix this with an antibiotic, what could happen? So if I well, it wouldn't make the antibiotic not work. If I give an antibiotic, what am I doing to the GI flora? Killing it. Kind of killing it off, right? And so this drug is a prodrug and requires colonic bacteria to activate it. So you potentially have less activation of the drug, right? So consider things like that. Um, certainly you can have binding uh, issues that can pop up. So things like iron supplements can bind it. Um, this can actually have a, a warfarin interaction where it actually kicks warfarin off of uh, the serum proteins. You can see increased uh, anticoagulant effects. So be aware of things like that. Um, and then obviously you can turn the, the urine stool, you know, yellow orange color. Um, so always warn your patients about changes to urine or stool color. Okay, so those are kind of your traditional um, non-biologic DMARs. This is kind of a newer agent. It's called tofacitinib or Zeljans. Um, so you guys remember all the way back in pharmacodynamics when we talked about tyrosine kinase. Or it being important or yeah, nope nothing okay we're we'll talking a little bit about here anyway tyrosine kinase are these important um cell signaling proteins are basically um they're being phosphorylated and they cause a lot of uh downstream changes within the cell a lot of gene transcription and things like that um and so we had this janus kinase uh, protein, which is a tyrosine kinase protein that uh, basically when you have the phosphorylation, when it gets activated, uh, it activates these stat proteins. Okay, These stat proteins can then go on and, and affect uh, regulation of, of inflammatory gene transcription. So if you were to inhibit this, if you could prevent those proteins from ever getting phosphorylated and ever activating those stat proteins, you can prevent a lot of those kind of inflammatory uh, uh, gene uh, factors really ever being from transcribed in the first place. And so this tofacitinib does that. It's a JAK inhibitor, meaning so it's blocking specifically uh, those, those uh, proteins there. And so you can kind of see on this picture here, now inflammatory cytokines like interleukin-2 and things like uh, interferon um, can all uh, lead to activation of those, uh, those JAK proteins. And so by inhibiting that, you eventually you know, uh, kind of decrease a lot of the inflammatory response that occurs due to binding of those uh, proteins. So um, this one is nice because it's available orally. You're going to see that's not the case with a lot of uh, our biologic agents. That's kind of one of the drawbacks to those. A lot of them have to be given either IV or subcutaneously. Um, and this one can be used either as monotherapy or you can use it in combination with other DMARDs. So you can use it with the biologics or non-biologics. doesn't really matter from that standpoint. Um, I'm sorry, uh, you can use it with the non-biologics. The biologics, you do not want to combine the problem there is you see too much immunosuppression, uh, and this is again the reason why we don't mix multiple biologics together, is because you just have such a potent suppression of the immune system, uh, the immune system that you worry about what? Infection. Infection, right? So you're going to see that would be a big problem with a lot of the, the biologic DMARDs, and that's a lot of black box warnings you're going to see is a risk for secondary infections and death, okay? So um, patients who have uh, significant renal or hepatic dysfunction, or if they have a SIP inhibitor on board, uh, specifically SIP 3A4, um, that can all raise levels of the drug, leading to further toxicity. So you want to go ahead and make sure you drop your dose before that. Um, also, uh, you want to test for latent TB. So again, make sure they have a negative TB test before starting this drug. Otherwise, they may need to get treatment for that first. Obviously, um, serious infections is going to be a big uh, issue with this one, the sort of black box warnings go. And there's also warnings for things like lymphoma and other malignancies. So it could be um, something that you necessarily don't want to start a patient off, especially that kind of more mild to moderate disease. Um, it could be useful if they've, you know, say methotrexate's not really working for them anymore. Potentially add this on or, or use it as monotherapy. Okay, so any questions on those? All right.
We're moving on to biologics. Um, so we've kind of talked about these before. Obviously, they end with MAB. Um, they are going to be a monoclonal antibody. So a lot of these uh, biologics are going to fall into that category. Um, just keep in mind that the uh, if you're ever curious where some of the por portions of the names come from, it's all back related to how they are made as far as what proteins are made, being made from. Um, so for instance, if they have U, they're mostly gonna be human proteins versus if it's like an XI, it's actually chimeric between human and what type of proteins? Mouse, yeah, so you have a lot of murine proteins or mouse proteins being uh, used here. So again, if your patients want to, you know, nibble on some cheese after getting their, you know, uh, you know Humira, uh, that's okay, just, just indulge them. Um, but again, uh, this can be important because as I increase the proportion of murine proteins, what do you think that increases the risk of? Allergic reactions, right? So anytime you're introducing kind of foreign proteins, um, you're increasing your risk for uh, allergic reactions. And so if I had full human antibodies and I'm injecting, less risk for that, right? Because the body's hopefully going to recognize that as just kind of a normal human protein and not react to it. So just keep uh, that in mind. Um, the biologics are going to be very effective uh, for treating rheumatoid arthritis, but they're also going to be very, very expensive. Um, most of these are recombinantly made products um, that are obviously proteins. They have to be injected either subcutaneously or intravenously. Um, so they're really kind of recommended for uh, after failure of a non-biologic DMARD. Okay, so it's kind of the, the thing you go to either second or third line. Um, there's also very little monitoring, so you don't see a ton of hepatotoxicity or um, you know, thrombocytopenia or, you know, uh, lymphocytopenia, things like that. You don't really see a lot of issues with that necessarily, uh, which is why the, the monitoring is much easier for these drugs. But a lot of them have black box warnings for increased risk of infection. You should be worried about that. Um, increased risk for, for TB or activation of TB. So again, you need to do a, a PPD beforehand. Um, and then if the patient has an active infection, uh, it's probably best to go ahead and discontinue uh, the therapy to allow them to kind of mount an immune response against that. Um, and kind of let them get over the hump and then you, know, you kind of restart therapy again. Um, and obviously don't give live vaccines because of the fact you have activation of those, uh, those bugs. Uh, the first group we'll talk about is probably the, the most uh, prominent one is going to be our TNF-alpha inhibitors, our tumor necrosis factor. Um, you're going to see that all of these are going to have uh, very similar side effects and contraindications uh, as a group. Uh, as far as relative contraindications go, you do want to worry about patients who have uh, more progressive CHF. So especially like, you know, stage three or four CHF, um, you can end up seeing uh, exacerbations of this kind of fluid overload. Um, not really sure the mechanism for this, um, but they have had, you know, increased CV death associated with things like infliximab and etanercept. So just be aware of that. Uh, they have, you know, pretty poor ejection fraction. Just maybe avoid those altogether and try another class of, of DMARDs. And then uh, for multiple sclerosis, uh, you can actually induce or exacerbate symptoms. Um, and so if this does occur, then go ahead and just discontinue use uh, for those patients. And obviously, uh, the black box warning, uh, not only for the infection risk, but also uh, for lymphoproliferative cancer uh, being a slight risk there as well. So uh, first one we'll talk about is going to be a Tanercept or Enbrel. Um, this one is actually uh, binding to inhibits uh, TNF uh, specifically, so that way you're going to have a decreased symptoms uh, of inflammation. Uh, hopefully you're going to have slowed joint destruction that happens over time. This one's actually kind of interesting because it's uh, basically two TNF receptors bound together uh, to a fragment of IgG. Uh, so essentially, uh, you know, the TNF thinks it's still binding to a TNF receptor, doesn't really know the difference in the ones it's bound, and then it's uh, kind of out of commission. Um, this one, you know, like I mentioned, with a lot of the biologics can be used either by themselves or in combination. So sometimes you'll see this used with methotrexate. Um, and generally, uh, Embryl, you're going to see it as a, a second line DMARD, um, not used quite as frequently. But again, uh, you'll see that these drugs uh, being uh, biologic products, they have a longer half-life than a lot of the other things you'll see. So you may need to give, you know, some of these uh, you know, traditional DMARDs, say, daily, uh, versus some of these you may be able to give uh, twice weekly. You may be able to get away with using uh, every six to eight weeks. And so we'll kind of look at that as we look at some of these uh, different agents. Obviously, um, <clears throat> injection site reactions are going to be a big thing anytime you're injecting foreign proteins. Um, so you, you do want to watch for that. Um, some patients require pretreatment beforehand with things like diphenhydramine and, and corticosteroids. Uh, so just be aware of that. Uh, probably one of the, the ones you're going to see more use of is going to be infliximab or Remicade. Um, this one is a chimeric antibody. You can tell by the XI that's in the name. Uh, so you're going to have some uh, mouse and human IgG kind of mixed together uh, to form the antibody there. Uh, so this one, again, is specifically binded to TNF-alpha. Uh, so you're going to see those decreased symptoms uh, of inflammation and joint damage.
Uh, you'll see uh, this is going to be used in RA patients uh, who are having inadequate response to methotrexate. So, you know, especially with the, the earlier RNA catch, I can start them on methotrexate, um, kind of keep them on that for a time, and then eventually maybe switch over to something like a Remicade. Um, and so actually one of the interesting things you see uh, is because you are giving a foreign protein, because you're going to have some, uh, some mouse protein that's in there, um, that some patients will actually respond better if you continue methotrexate in addition to this drug, because methotrexate being kind of a, an immunosuppressant will actually prevent uh, the body from kind of mounting a response to the, the infliximab. So you can actually remain effective for longer because the body doesn't really generate any antigens to that specific um, product you're injecting. That makes sense? Okay, uh, so again, this can help to decrease some of the infusion reactions um, and, and um, decrease some of the efficacy over time. So it could be a, one of the good rational approaches for using methotrexate plus something like infliximab. Um, this one is given IV only, and this one is going to be one of those ones you kind of have to go into like an infusion center or to a clinic in order to receive. Um, and so you can notice here that say you're giving it, um, you know, at day one, you give it at week two, week six, and then you can give it every eight weeks after that, kind of once you have control of symptoms. Um, so again, it's less convenient from a, a patient standpoint, the fact they have to go into a place to have this infused, but, um, you know, nice in the fact you don't have to have it every two months, you know, at, at a point. Um, <clears throat> This drug I do see a significant amount of allergic reactions to uh, as far as infusion reactions go. Um, so it's really important that it's infused very slowly at first. So say, for instance, you know, kids coming in, you have JRA, uh, juvenile rheumatoid arthritis, and they're giving them infliximab. You have to start at just a few mLs per hour at first to kind of see how they respond to it. Some of them you have to pre-treat with corticosteroids and, and, and Benadryl beforehand. Uh, and then you kind of gently titrate the rate up until you can infuse it over the full two hours. Um, so some patients have got such severe disease that you have to do desensitization protocols, or if this is the only drug that works for them, you have to give them very dilute concentrations of the drug and then eventually kind of build them up to it so they don't have a full anaphylactic reaction. So it's, it's rare you see that, but uh, just be aware because of the fact this has mouse protein in it, um, you're more likely to see those allergic reactions. And then obviously, um, you know, uh, risk for infections is going to be the, the other big thing you're, you're worried about with these guys. Okay. Um, usually if they have like a really severe allergic reaction, um, you're going to give them, you know, things like corticosteroids and, and diphenhydramine. Can you guys think of any other meds you might give along with that? A severe allergic reaction. Yeah. So sometimes you'll have, uh, a lot of times you'll have, um, these patients will have kind of a, a, an epi kit or you know epi pen or something like that at the bedside ready to go just in case the patient does have a reaction to it. So it's one of the things you want to have those meds kind of on hand just in case the, the worst occurs, right? So always uh, hope those, for the best, but prepare for the worst. And those reactions are to the mouse. Um, it is to, it's to the full antibody, but yes, you're, the higher risk is due to that, that foreign protein and the mouse protein. Uh, the next one is going to be adalimumab or Humira. Again, this is targeted against TNF-alpha. Um, this one is an all-human protein, so we're going to have less risk for allergy. So this is kind of a nice thing. And this one is able to be given subcutaneously. So this is one that comes in pens um, that patients can administer themselves. Um, obviously, you have to consider things like, you know, a patient with kind of uh, extensive rheumatoid arthritis, um, how good is the use of their hands potentially? not super great, right? So if you're giving them there, you know, say they live by themselves or something, uh, a pen might not really work for them. They may not be able to administer the drug. So maybe that's why you choose something like infliximab where they go in uh, and have an infusion done versus say having to give them uh, the cells a shot, right? So consider patient factors as well and whether or not they can even use the med. So um, this one can be used as monotherapy for RA. So again, either that or used in combination with some of the, the non-biologics um, and, and um, as far as side effects, it's going to be very similar to what we see with the, the infliximab, just usually or less uh, injection site reactions. Uh, next, you have a Batacept or Arencia. Um, there's uh, um, you know, a lot of the TNF alpha inhibitors. There's more that I listed on that slide. I'm probably, they all are very, very similar to one another. So like Galimimab or Simpani, like um, you're going to see that uh, their actual FDA approved indications um, may differ from agent to agent. So for instance, um, you remember, uh, some like form of psoriasis, I think like Gilemimab guys like first indication for it, but um, because they're all the same mechanism of action, they're all going to work very, very similarly to one another and very, very similar side effects. So, um, you know, as far as like testing purposes go, the ones I focus on here are probably going to be more likely to show up on, on the, the test. Just be aware that, uh, be able to recognize those other drugs as, as being a TNF alpha inhibitor or whatever it happens to be. Okay. Make sense? Yeah. But if you've seen one TNF alpha inhibitor, you've pretty much seen them all. Could just be differences in like how you infuse it or how often you have to give it, but basically very similar activity. 
Okay, um, so next one you're going to go to this uh, co-modulation or co-stimulation modulator, um, and so this is going to be better for patients who have more mild uh, to severe disease, uh, not severe disease, but severe disease, uh, have failed kind of other forms of therapy. Um, I hate that one because PowerPoint never catches that with the little red squiggly line, unfortunately. But anywho, um, don't sever anything off your RA patients. We like to keep their limbs if possible. Okay. Um, but this one's going to be binding to CD80 and 86 receptors. Okay, so by binding to those, it actually prevents the interaction uh, between uh, T cells and the antigen presenting cells. So again, this helps to prevent uh, the T cells from being activated. You're going to have less inflammatory um, activity happening here. Okay, um, so that's why by binding to those two receptors, you prevent that interplay uh, between the two different types of cells. So uh, this one's given uh, ends up being given every four weeks. Um, can be used either as mono or combination therapy. So again, not two biologics at the same time, but say methotrexate plus a batacept or you know uh, infliximab plus hydroxychloroquine. Those are okay combinations, but you wouldn't want to do uh, Humira plus a batacept. Okay? It really wouldn't make a whole lot of sense because uh, you cause such immunosuppression that you, the risk of infection would be too great for them. Uh, next one we have is rituximab or rituxin. This one is specifically a monoclonal antibody against CD20. Uh, this is a receptor that's on the B lymphocytes. And so by binding to this, you end up having a near complete uh, depletion of your B cells. Okay. Um, thus, you're going to have less antigen presentation to the T cells, so the T cells don't get activated because there's less B cells. Um, even after discontinuation, it takes a long time for the body to kind of help recover to this because it is uh, those B cells just basically just get decimated by this drug. And so, um, you know, you need to keep in mind that their uh, return to their immune system is not going to be super immediate, right? Uh, it's going to take time for them to really kind of be able to mount a really good immune response there. Um, this one is being given, um, uh, you know, obviously it's a chimeric protein. Again, the, the XI kind of cl uh, clues into that. Um, patients have to be pre-treated for this one because the, the allergic reaction risk is so high for them. So it's uh, very common patients to automatically get, you know, a dose of hydrocortisone or methylprednisolone um, and Benadryl prior to getting an infusion of this med. Uh, next, you have tocilizumab or Actimra. Um, this one is an antibody against interleukin-6. So interleukin-6 is an important uh, inflammatory mediator. So by uh, binding that up, prevent it from having its activity. Um, and so this is going to be typically used for patients who have kind of failure to the TNF blocker. So, so typically you start off with the TNF, you know, obviously you know, kind of the at time of diagnosis, you start with something like methotrexate, uh, then you would move on to like a TNF inhibitor. And then if you fail that, that's when you start to move to other things like an IL-6 blocker or uh, rituximab or, or things like that. So it's kind of going by a stepwise approach based on how they're responding uh, and how their kind of disease is progressing. So, um, Again, similar side effects you're going to see here. Uh, kind of unique one, you can see a risk for GI perforation. Not really sure of the mechanism for that. Um, that's a possibility there. Uh, and this one will actually induce CYP3A4. Uh, so you can see some issues. So especially with our warfarin, you may see decreased anticoagulant uh, activity. Uh, if they're on birth control, you may metabolize that too quickly and have, uh, have failure there. So especially that can be problematic if you had a patient who was of, say, childbearing potential. Uh, they are on, say, methotrexate and tocilizumab and they're on birth control to prevent pregnancy, you see where that might be a problem, right? So uh, failure of the, the birth control can be a big issue for those patients. So, uh, you know, those are the, the brunt of the, the um, biologic agents. I'll get into detail for here, just for uh, your guys' sanity's purpose, right? Because um, there's new ones always coming out, um, and it's very, very difficult to keep up with a lot of them unless you actually work specifically uh, in that field uh, for the most part. But, um, you know, you will see with biologic agents, there's approximately about a third of patients will, will end up failing this. Um, you may see patients who have a kind of a primary lack of efficacy, so you don't really see any response uh, within three to six months, um, but you may have kind of secondary la uh, lack of efficacy as well. So uh, for some patients, they may start to initially get better, uh, but then you kind of don't have a sustained response to that. So it could be related to um, it could be related to disease progression. It could be related to lots of different factors, like we mentioned with the infliximab. You know, if your body starts to generate antibodies against that, uh, it's going to uh, neutralize it, and it's not going to be as effective, right? Um, so it could be a secondary cause for failure. Other things could be just adverse effects. So, um, you know, if they were to have CHF and that's worsened, you may uh, lead to discontinuation therapy, or if they have a, a serious infection, you know, it could all be reasons for for discontinuing. So. Um, Again, uh, for patients who are having, say, lack of efficacy, you can add on and on biologic DMARD, uh, potentially, or consider switching mechanisms of action. So maybe TNF-alpha is not really the, the 
you know, main mover and shaker for their RA, maybe switching to an IL-6 inhibitor or switching to a CD20 uh, receptor antagonist, something like that um, can lead to better efficacy depending on the patient. But again, combination biologic therapy is not recommended just due to the immunosuppression. <coughs> So then you have corticosteroids. So potentially corticosteroids, do, do you think that would have any effect on disease progression? We think yes, right? Because you're, you're still decreasing the amount of inflammation that's occurring. So you imagine that, yeah, that would actually be pretty good. Um, but obviously the problems are going to be side effects, right? So um, this is the reason why uh, we don't use, you know, mega doses of, of corticosteroids for kind of chronic long-term maintenance of RA, just due to the, these issues here. But um, they are going to be a mainstay of therapy. They're also going to be good for symptomatic response uh, or sim uh, dealing with kind of the symptoms of RA as well. So um, kind of using kind of a dual purpose here with our corticosteroids. Because, um, you know, they're anti-inflammatory, they're immunosuppressive, um, do lots of things like decreasing prostaglandin, the leukotriene synthesis, and uh, basically kind of work on all aspects of the inflammation. Because, again, they're working directly uh, to prevent things like arachidonic acid from, from being uh, produced and, and all, that, uh, all the downstream effects. So um, corticosteroids uh, are going to be used typically uh, for chronic therapy. You're going to see a lot of patients end up on something like methotrexate plus low-dose corticosteroids every single day. Um, some people may try to use, say, every other day therapy to try to limit the kind of systemic load uh, of or systemic exposure the patients are getting, but that doesn't uh, work uh, very effectively. So a lot of patients are going to be on daily uh, things like prednisone or methylprednisolone or, or dexamethasone, depending on um, what they're recommended. Some patients will be on kind of bridge therapy where uh, if they are using the corticosteroids to kind of help get their immediate symptoms under control until something like a biologic can kick in or something like methotrexate can really kick in. These are useful to keep, kind of keeping those symptoms kind of tamped down a little bit. Um, you're also going to see these being used for a disease flare up So this is where your know, patient has severe uh, exacerbation of their disease. This is where IV therapy can be very useful. Um, you know, especially if they're having to be admitted for this. Um, give them IV therapy for a few days uh, to a week. Uh, hopefully, get the symptoms under control, and then you can kind of taper them off potentially um, to see how they how they do. Um, you may see intramuscular uh, use uh, being used uh, occasionally. Um, you know, again for short acting. Uh, you're going to short, short acting versions of the corticosteroids for kind of burst therapy for the exacerbations, but you may have some patients who are on um, long acting depo forms of, of the corticosteroids. Again, this is good for patients who maybe have compliance issues or um, for whatever reason daily you know, therapy with oral is not really going to work for them. Um, so you can see um, you know things like uh, triamcinolone uh, or um, um, like methylprednisolone has long acting forms that you can inject. Uh, and basically, the, the other nice thing is you're going to have kind of less withdrawal effects because as you give someone corticosteroids, say for over a week, you run into what problem? Right, adrenal insufficiency, right? Because the adrenal glands say, hey, I got all these corticosteroids around. I don't need to make anything myself. And so they start to atrophy. Uh, and so it takes time for them to kind of get back on board. So anytime you give corticosteroids for longer than a week, you need to taper them. Okay, um, it's only two or three days, you don't have to worry about it, but if it's a week or longer, you want to taper them. But having an intramuscular kind of long-acting form, it has a natural taper to its uh, levels anyway, so you see less risk for the adrenal insufficiency, especially if they miss a dose and then don't come back in time. And then uh, in some cases, you're going to see intra-articular uh, injections being used. Uh, this is good for a relatively small number of joints. Um, the other benefit is you're going to see less systemic uh, absorption, so you see less kind of systemic side effects from this one. So, for instance, uh, that little boy I talked about who had uh, JRA, um, he really just had the one knee that was really giving him a ton of problems. And so, really, that was the only joint that really needed the injection of the corticosteroids, and that was enough for, for him, right? That's nice because you don't have to give him systemic corticosteroids. It can affect him in, in numerous ways um, for something that's only really affecting one joint. So um, really, they don't recommend more than two or three administrations of intra-articular corticosteroids in a year, uh, mainly because by giving too much corticosteroids right there in the site, uh, you can actually see uh, tendon atrophy, and then you actually see further joint destruction. So it's kind of counteracting what we hopefully would do, um, but that's why we don't give it super frequently, okay? So some patients may, you know, um, get to a point where they're taking pretty regularly, but really shouldn't be more than uh, two or three times a year. Okay. Um, some caveats with using corticosteroids. Obviously, the lowest dose possible should always be used, so it's kind of 
gently titrating to see what the patient responds to. Um, you know, it could help, especially early on in therapy, to kind of help uh, lead to fewer radiographic progressions uh, of disease. Um, but for the most part, we don't know that uh, for long-term use, you really get a whole ton of um, benefit as far as it, from its DMARD kind of actions. Um, so really, these are going to mainly be used for just uh, symptom management uh, along with something like our NSAIDs. Okay. Um, we know we've talked about adverse effects for these drugs before, but things like you know, HPA axis suppression, uh, osteoporosis, because again, what type of patients are being affected by RA? Older ladies who are also at risk for uh, osteoporosis. So again, you want to make sure you're topping them off with other things like calcium and vitamin D. We'll talk about that a little bit later in this section when we get to that. Obviously, uh, myopathies, cataracts, hirsutism, all kinds of other problems you're going to see um, with these drugs, especially um, older patients that develop hyperlipidemia, diabetes, all that can be worsened as well. So, um, and also corticosteroids do what to the immune system? Suppress it. So you're also at risk for further infection. So this is why we try to titrate to the lowest dose possible to help manage their symptoms. Uh, the other kind of uh, key component to symptomatic management for these patients will also be our NSAIDs. Uh, again, these are going to provide good analgesic, antipyretic, and anti-inflammatory actions, which is why we don't really use acetaminophen a lot because it doesn't do anything at the site of inflammation. It's really working more centrally. So acetaminophen really has no use uh, in RA as opposed to the, the NSAIDs. Um, certainly, we can use uh, you know um, over-the-counter varieties, but oftentimes they're going to end up getting put on uh, prescription strength ones. Uh, and again, uh, we have talked about that in ortho and pain management. So for instance, say you had a patient who had a history of cardiovascular disease, uh, what type of NSAID do you think would be good for them? Do do a COX-2 inhibitor? Oh. Yeah, so you want to use a non-selective uh, COX inhibitor, right? But if they had a history of, say, gastric ulcers, You'd want to use Celecox, a person like uh, meloxicam that has a little bit more affinity for the COX-2 enzyme, right? Because that's going to be more gastroprotective, okay? So it's where those patients are on kind of chronic use of uh, NSAIDs is where you might see something like mesoprostol being used, right? We talked about it being a prostaglandin uh, that can help to kind of stimulate uh, that protective barrier in the stomach. So this is where you might see um, use of drugs like that, right? They have to use a non-selective uh, NSAID. So consider your NSAIDs, consider your patient. Um, you know, all that stuff could be game for uh, kind of considering these RA patients uh, for testing purposes. Okay, um, so again, uh, you'll see the NSAIDs, uh, you know, are good for adjunctive therapy uh, to analgesics, especially in osteoarthritis, um, or they can be used by themselves. So NSAIDs will kind of get used in either OA or RA. Uh, that's hard to say all that vowels at the same time. But um, again, for uh, RA patients, you're going to see this is going to be good chronic mainstay of therapy. So almost all of them are going to be on chronic use uh, of these um, NSAIDs. Uh, again, they don't do anything for disease uh, progression. They're only going to be used for symptomatic management. And so it's important to make sure you're uh, looking at adequate doses, look at duration of therapy. Um, you know, sometimes maybe drug holidays are okay for, for them, you know, if their symptoms are kind of under control. It just really depends. Um, look at things like, you know, their renal function. You know, they taking a hit because of the inside effects there. So consider all aspects of your patient. So, um, you know, if they if the patient needs to be on low-dose aspirin for cardiovascular protection, that's okay to add on an inset on top of that. But if they're taking much higher doses of aspirin than that, then obviously you worry about toxicity, bleeding risk, and, and GI ulcers and, and things like that. Um, and the COX-2 inhibitors are going to be just as effective as the other NSAIDs, but are better for your patients who have a history of gastric, uh, gastric issues. Again, um, we mentioned the, the cardiovascular risk there. So if they have a history uh, of cardiovascular stuff, like maybe using a non-selective NSAID is going to be a better option for them. Okay, so just an idea uh, of kind of how uh, therapy is going to go with your um, RE kind of algorithm. Again, this is all a stepwise approach based on kind of um, starting with kind of the easiest things first and then uh, using other agents as, as things fail or as the disease is just progressing on its own. So, uh, for instance, you start with a patient who's DMARD, naive, uh, with RA that have kind of a, either low to high uh, disease activity. You generally are going to start all these patients on, on some sort of DMARD. Um, generally, methotrexate is going to be your first go-to, right, because it's kind of the most evidence behind that. Um, you can you know, obviously have NSAIDs on board for symptomatic management, and then you kind of plus or minus on the prednisone. All right, so especially for patients who are on new diagnosis, you may need to keep them on a little bit higher doses of corticosteroids until you've got their symptoms under control, and then you know the methotrexate's working, and then you can titrate down on that. Okay, so consider that. Don't just set your you know corticosteroid dose and, and forget it. Um, you need to make sure you're kind of titrating that to make sure you're limiting adverse effects while still maintaining good symptom control. Um, 
as you continue on, uh, you can either look at using combination DMARD therapy or you can use something like uh, a TNF inhibitor, um, so a tumor necrosis factor inhibitor by itself, plus or minus methotrexate, right? Or you can even look at a non-TNF uh, biologic. So um, again, this is the step where you can either keep the methotrexate on board, add on, uh, either say like a, another traditional DMARD like hydroxychloroquine, um, or most often though you're going to end up adding on a biologic. So this is where a TNF inhibitor most often, but certainly other ones could be effective here as well. And then um, you could also look at uh, potentially using tofacitinib here. Again, this is one of the newer agents, um, so uh, not as much kind of uh, use behind it, or at least have, uh, I guess experience with it, I should say, but uh, tofacitinib plus or minus methotrexate could be used at this step as well. Okay. Um, and then uh, considering how they respond to that, um, so say for instance they have a uh, failure with a TNF inhibitor, um, then well you can try something like uh, you know a TNF inhibitor. If you didn't have methotrexate on beforehand, add methotrexate on. See how they respond to that. That can improve the efficacy of things like infliximab uh, that you may develop antibodies against, right? Or you could try switching mechanisms altogether and use something like a IL-6 inhibitor or a CD20 inhibitor. And uh, you know, on the other hand, if they had non-TNF biologic failure, this is where you can in initiate TNF. So again, it's all a matter of kind of seeing how your patient responds to and just taking that stepwise approach to saying, okay, well, if that didn't work, let's try adding this on. Or this didn't work, let's try switching a mechanism here. Okay, there's not going to be any one right answer to any of this. Um, besides, don't mix two biologics together. Um, but just looking at your patient, how they respond to it. So I might ask a question on the test. Let's so say, for instance, uh, you have a patient who has, uh, say, stage three uh, CHF. Um, their ejection fraction is like you know 45%, um, and they fail methotrexate. What might be a next good drug to go to? And you say, well. Thinking back on what Dr. Wood said, uh, a TNF inhibitor might not be the best option because we saw that, that can worsen CHF. So maybe something like uh, a co-modulator uh, or co-receptor modulator inhibitor might be good, right? So maybe um, you know, something like a Batacept is, is okay. Or maybe something like a CD20 or receptor antagonist or rituximab is, is the correct answer here. So consider that. Look at um, you know look at their disease states. Um, that's oftentimes going to be the, one of the bigger things that kind of directs you towards one drug versus another. Okay. That makes sense? So again, looking at the combination therapy, something like uh, two non-biologics is totally fine together. Just keep in mind, they may have additive toxicity here, whether it be myelosuppression, uh, could be hepatotoxicity. Um, just keep that in mind, look at the adverse effects and see how they respond to that. Um, probably best to avoid mixing methotrexate and leflunamide just due to uh, the risk of hepatotoxicity being pretty high there. So I'd probably avoid that one, uh, but any of the others are, are fine to use. And again, before we had the biologics, this is all we had. So you know, some patients might even end up uh, ended up being treated with three non-biologics at a time. Okay, It's all a matter of looking at efficacy versus the toxicity you're experiencing. Looking at uh, you know traditional plus plus a biologic, obviously um, you can look at combining any of the, the different uh, mechanisms here. Um, it's really not so important. Just really monitoring to see how they uh, how they're responding to it. Okay, so any questions on that section of treating RA? You do because you worry about things like you know stunting growth and, and all kinds of other, you know bone formation and all kinds of other things like that. Um, so yes, uh, do you sometimes just have to give it anyway just due to how bad their uh, their diseases? Sometimes. Um, so again, it's one of those things where you really try to. It's hard to say because I don't deal with those patients um, one on one. A lot of times, usually I see them coming in to the hospital for flare ups. Right, so of course they're on corticosteroids at that point, right? Usually on some IV round-the-clock therapy until they get their symptoms under control, um, and usually they're getting tuned up on what their kind of DMARD therapy is going to be. Um, I probably see, if I had to guess, I see them jump to using the biologics more quickly. Hard to say if they do that, you know, all the time. It probably depends on the rheumatologist, um, but just because those are so much more potent uh, and you avoid a lot of the toxicity. So, for instance, if I have a young kid, um, you know, giving them methotrexate uh, might not be the best option for them from a liver standpoint and, and all those other uh, factors. Um, but using kind of a very specific TNF inhibitor might be okay for them, right? Just based on on side effect profile and whatnot. But again, all depends on what's your patient's insurance. Like, are they going to be able to cover, you know, $100,000 worth of, of drug, you know, throughout the year, you know? So it's an important consideration, you know, um, 
you know, us, we deal with a high propensity of Medicaid patients. So, um, you know, they're always obviously looking to, you know, cut reimbursement as, as much as possible. And, and so they have to consider, well, what's the cost of, of a disease flare up uh, and treating them in inpatient versus the cost of this drug therapy for the year? It might weigh out and, and it might be easier to give them the biologic, keep them out of the hospital. So uh, there's a lot of kind of pluses and minuses to everything you have to consider that. But that's, that's a very good question. Anything else? All right. So moving on, um, so acetaminophen, you're going to see this being the backbone for a lot of uh, therapy for osteoarthritis. Um, it's a very good one because, uh, again, uh, NSAIDs can be somewhat useful, uh, but there's not a ton of real inflammation that's happening necessarily as compared to something like a rheumatoid arthritis when you have OA. Um, the nice thing here is you limit a lot of the toxicity. Uh, that you would see from the NSAID. So there's really no gastric toxicity. There's really no, um, you know, issues with, um, you know, especially cardiovascular disease. Uh, what's the one toxicity you do have to worry about with acetaminophen? Hepatotoxicity, right? So it's very, very important you make sure that the patients are considering all forms of acetaminophen they're taking. We talked about this in the ortho section, but for chronic osteoarthritis, these patients are really at high risk for kind of overdoing it and self-medicating. And so um, these are the ones you want to make sure they get under tight pain control. Um, this is where you need, you're probably going to have to use some adjuvant therapy as well. The uh, acetaminophen is generally not going to do it on its own. So um, again, typically you want to do kind of around the clock therapy. So you can say, okay, you're going to do one gram every six hours uh, around the clock. So that way you get kind of better control of kind of that baseline pain that they may be experiencing, right? Uh, and then we'll have other meds that may be useful for kind of the, those breakthrough pain moments. Now, as far as uh, topical products go, if you have a relatively small number of joints being affected, um, topical therapy can be a very good option because it helps to limit systemic uh, toxicity you may experience. So topical insets can be utilized uh, for first line option, you know, for knee osteoarthritis. If you know, say they've failed acetaminophen or they have some contraindication to receiving it, um, especially in older patients, they greater than 75 years of age, um, who have you know risk for cardiovascular toxicity, GI toxicity. Topical inset products can be really good for them, right? Um, so the, the, one of the big ones you'll see uh, people go with is Volterran gel or diclofenac. That'd be a very good option, um, or like a, a salicylate-based product like aspirin cream or something could be another good one there as well. Okay, um, so again, just limited uh, systemic uh, exposure they're getting working directly at the site of action. So that could be uh, really kind of beneficial to your patients. Um, capsaicin is another good one. We've talked about capsaicin previously. How does that work? Yes, yeah, so you get rid of the substance P. Um, and so it's going to basically make those nerves not really as sensitized to the pain that they may be experiencing. Um, what's the other big caveat to using capsaicin? You've got to use it consistently. Even it's going to burn at first when they use it, but they have to use it consistently. They'll kind of get over that. What would you say? Wash your hands. Yeah, wash your hands. Absolutely. You don't want to rub your eyes afterwards. Uh, here's some of this is pretty good with your avocados. You can just kind of mix that in. And, <laughs> yeah. Um, you can use some other counter irritants as well that can be useful. This is where, like, you know, your Bengay creams and things that are menthol or camphor based um, can all be useful as well. Um, so, again, uh, whenever you're dealing with a small number of joints, it's probably uh, beneficial to use some of these topical therapies before resorting over to more systemic ones. So uh, the other uh, thing to consider is intraarticular corticosteroids. So this is kind of one uh, place where corticosteroids get more use. Or this is where uh, you'll see corticosteroids used uh, for osteoarthritis. You really don't want to use systemic therapy um, to deal with pain due to osteoarthritis. It's really not going to be super useful, and you're only going to see side effects. Um, so you can see this as an alternative, especially if they're having a knee or hip osteoarthritis as being uncontrolled by other therapies. So if NSAIDs aren't doing it, acetaminophen is not doing it, um, you can occasionally use these intraarticular uh, corticosteroids. So again, don't give them more than uh, once every three months. Uh, because you worry about tendon atrophy, you know, I'm seeing uh, decreased uh, cartilage uh, formation, things like that. So um, very effective for dealing with the pain, but just don't use them very frequently. Opioids uh, should always be used as kind of second line therapy once they failed other things, uh, but they can be good for short term use. Um, certainly for long term treatment of pain, we don't have as much evidence for, even though a lot of people uh, still end up using it. Um, so try to limit as much opioid therapy as possible. What are some good like uh, opioid options you might put a patient on if they're experiencing chronic osteoarthritis? Percocet. Percocet's good. Percocet has what in it? Tylenol. And? And oxycodone. Oxycodone, yeah. yeah. Oxycontin is what uh, formulation of oxycodone. Yeah, so oxycontin is a long So every here, oxycontin, that's usually the one that's like lasting 12 hours or so. Um, but yeah, so Percocets, acetaminophen, uh, oxycodone. What else? It's similar to oxycodone. 
So if you dunked it underwater, it would become hydrocodone, hydrocodone right? Um, th that doesn't actually work. It just dissolves. <laughs> like, um, yeah, so hydrocodone would be another good one. So like your your Norcos, your lower tabs, right? Those so um, those contain hydrocodone plus acetaminophen, right? So those are your good combination therapies. Is there any other options you can give them? Yeah, it's so like fentanyl. What what formulation? Yeah, fentanyl transdermal is a good one, right? Because we don't really have any oral uh, fentanyl options besides like the lollipop, and so you don't use those for a lot of patients. So like you know palliative care or cancer patients. Um, yeah, so transdermal fentanyl might be used for, for better for kind of chronic management, right? Um, oral morphine is another good option as well, right? So you, so you have some options there. Um, even oral uh, hydromorphone or dilated can, can be optional as well. Uh, so again, short-term therapy, try to limit the side effects. Again, you guys have known all about that. So again, if it comes up again, you guys will know all about it. Okay, uh, so one kind of new thing we'll mention here is going to be glucosamine and chondroitin. Um, so this is typically going to be sold as more like a dietary supplement. There's not really a specific um, kind of FDA approved version, at least that I'm aware of. Um, but essentially, uh, both these products are found in cartilage and in the synovial fluid. Um, you can see increases in proteoglycan synthesis, uh, which helps to generate and help to repair some of the cartilage and hopefully prevent some further breakdown. Okay, so if anything, you could consider something as a DMARD therapy for osteoarthritis, this might be considered it. Um, studies have seen some moderate effects uh, in improving OA symptoms, uh, but this is certainly not going to be a silver bullet. But it's definitely not something um, that would be problematic if your patients wanted to add this on to their other therapies. You don't really see a lot of interactions here, not a ton of side effects associated with it. So. Um, you know, could be only potential benefits. It's important when you're dealing with dietary supplements that your patient is getting uh, a reputable brand and they're kind of getting the same brand every time um, because of the fact there's not a lot of good regulation on what they are producing uh, and how much of the stuff they're actually even reporting. Uh, it's important they, they get some, you know, a good product. They don't want to, you know, skimp out and get the, you know, the really crappy brand or something that doesn't really have as much of the drug in there as they're, as they're purporting. So, um, Again, you're going to see that most of it's been, been studied in knee osteoarthritis, but certainly hip and other, other joints uh, can be useful as well. Um, they, uh, the American College of Rheumatology, um, the guidelines uh, at the time do not support making specific recommendations, but certainly something if your patient wants to try it, uh, they're more than happy to, to try it out. Um, keep in mind though, that the glucosamine uh, is actually made up from like crushed up like shrimp shell and, and other shellfish that they have a shellfish allergy. You want to avoid the glucosamine. Uh, chondroitin is actually made from uh, cartilage. You usually get from like either beef or like sharks and things like that. Um, but the glucosamine itself is the one that has a shellfish allergy. Okay, so if it were to come up on a test question, you said which of these patients might be uh, contraindicated from receiving this? You might say the shellfish allergy, right? So uh, the other things you can consider would be hyaluronic uh, injections. So these are intra-articular injections for the knee uh, that can help with a, a lot of the pain associated with osteoarthritis. Uh, basically, it's a constituent uh, of synovial fluid that's already there anyway and has some good anti-inflammatory properties. So um, this can actually help reduce some of the pain, uh, restore some joint mobility for those patients. Uh, and you see given um, you know, once a week for three to five weeks or so. Uh, so you kind of do this in kind of courses. Um, and then once their pain starts to get worse, then you can consider a new, new course of hyaluronic injections. Um, this one's nice, relatively free of side effects, no real problems associated with it. Can you give a hyaluronic injection after you've given a steroid injection and that no longer works? Um, yes, they're not. You're probably going to get more actual like bang for your buck out of a uh, corticosteroid injection. Um, this might be good, good for more kind of sustained relief in between those times where you can't really get another corticosteroid shot, right? I don't know if they can be given at the same time, um, but there's certainly nothing saying you can't use both of them. Is this like a Synvisc? Yes, this is similar, yep. The Synvisc, is, there's several different brain names that are out there, but uh, they're all basically kind of same, similar permutations on the hyaluronate. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and cut it there. Um, you guys have any questions? All right, I will see you guys on Thursday.